Hello everybody, my name is Brajesh Patel. I'm the Head Strength Conditioning Coach at Quinnipiac University. I'm happy to talk to you guys today about how we implement RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset, and LDOA into our team setting. First of all, thank you to Coach DeMarco for asking me to be part of this virtual internship, and I hope that I can um, share with you um, some of the things that we do to help our student athletes get better. So the goals of this lecture are to gain a better understanding of fascia, why it's important to understand as professionals, and ways that it can impact and ultimately improve our performance. I think my journey is, is important to understand um, because I learned about RPR back in 2016, and um, that took me on a pretty deep dive into understanding it and understanding how the system works, um, but also it's kind of led me into this... Uh, uh, this deeper dive of understanding the nervous system and understanding fascia and um, that's kind of led me to Eldoa and these are definitely things that have, that have um, played a role into our program and, um, and how we impact our student athletes. So we're first going to start with the nervous system and specifically the peripheral part of the nervous system and really the autonomic nervous system because as we, as we all know this, the nervous system governs everything and it controls everything within our body. Um, we're going to specifically talk about the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system because it has a direct impact upon our fascia and how our body ultimately is going to be able to move. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is a part of the part of, part of the autonomic nervous system that controls our fight or flight response, while the parasympathetic on the opposite side is controls our rest and digest responses. And both of these systems are going to be activated in response to stress. And if you've never read Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcer, I highly recommend that book because it's a great read on how stress ultimately impacts every system in our body, um, our muscular system, our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, lymphatic, endocrine, vestibular, immune system, etc. And what we really need to do is we understand, we understand what stress is. So stress is a term that, come from, that came from psychology and biology, and it was then later borrowed by physics and engineering and first used in bi biological context in the 1930s. It refers to the consequence of the failure to respond adequately to emotion, mental, emotional, or physical demands, whether it's actual or imagined on the body. So when someone perceives a threat, their nervous system responds by, flood, by releasing a flood of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol, and also neuropepti neuropeptides into the bloodstream. These hormones rouse the body for emergency action. The stress response is the body's way of protecting the person. When working properly, it helps sustain focused, energetic, and very alert. Physiologists define stress as how the body reacts to a stressor, real or imagined, that causes stress. Acute stressors affect you in the short term, while chronic stressors are over the longer term, and that's achieved by the autonomic nervous system, and we need to make sure that we have balance between those two systems. So the stress response, right? And number one, increases our sympathetic tone. And again, like I said before, it could be physical stress, mental stress, emotional stress. The body can't really differentiate it. It only recognizes it as stress. And when the body experiences that, it's going to increase sympathetic nervous system activity, which is in the, the corresponding actions are increased heart rate, blood pressure, um, muscle tone is going to change, uh, your posture is going to change, you're also going to create some lymphatic stasis throughout your body, um, which is a result of catecholam catecholamine clearing. That can all lead to defensive postures, which leads to decreased proprioception, poor CNS response, muscle age symmetries, inhibited diaphragm, upper lower cross syndromes, basically a whole host of um, possible negative reactions. So the basic concept to realize is stress is going to affect every system in the body. So some CNS responses to stressful postures are poor muscle proprioception, inaccurate information to the CNS, therefore a poor response because our proprioceptions are going to be altered, um, which ultimately is going to Im impact our um, alignment and our length tension relationships. Um, it's going to affect our breathing. Um, it's going to affect our endocrine response, our emotional response, um, and a big thing to understand too is our emotional state can be embedded within our fascia, and fascia is something that we're going to talk about later. But some of the costs of stress long term, um, aging, weight gain, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, digestive problems, nervous breakdown, burnout, um, some emotional responses that can happen are anxiety, fear, restlessness, irritability, anger, depression, insecurity, loss of libido, impaired memory and concentration, explosives, excessive smoking and drinking. So not a lot of good things happen to um, 
in terms of stress. So now stress isn't all bad. Um, it's really important to understand that that we have eustress and good, uh, which is good stress, and then distress, which is bad stress. Um, the more the stress we're talking here is a little bit more maladaptive in the in in the the negative side of stress. Um, but it's all it depends on how we handle it. And um, in this presentation, we're not going to talk about how we can handle um, stress in terms of coping skills, but more um, the impact they can have our body and some of the things that we can do to affect that. So. The next thing we really want to understand is human beings need to breathe and move, and stress is going to ultimately affect how we breathe and move. What we're trying to do is start to interrupt that process, and the best one of the best ways we can do that is with the deep diaphragmatic breathing. Um, the only way to activate this parasympathetic response is through diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and the key thing to understand here is that when we are in a sympathetically stressed state, it's going to increase sympathetic tone, which is going to put us into more of an extended posture, it's, which makes it a little bit more challenging to be able to use our diaphragm to breathe correctly and breathe properly. So we want to make sure that we can get our breathing down right because number one, that's going to put us into a little bit more of a parasympathetic state. It's going to help increase that relaxation response, but also too, it's going to help change our postures and postures can in fact impact our nervous system, just like body language can impact our nervous system. So when we talk about diaphragmatic breathing, we want to make sure that we're getting the right amount of gas exchange. Um, we also want to make sure that we want to be able to use it correctly and properly because it's going to be able to, um, it's going to change our length tension relationship for the muscles that attach to that diaphragm, but also to the muscles that attach to that rib cage and pelvis. And ultimately, that's going to help our, our, our ability to move a little bit more efficiently. So we want to make sure that we breathe right through our diaphragm, in through our nose, out through our mouth. But when we engage this diaphragm, we're going to increase our vagal tone. Um, and then this is just a little graph or a little picture from PRI. Um, and if you've never been exposed to PRI, it's a, it's a physical therapy based model, but it's really good at helping us understand um, biomechanics. I think it's, it probably does the best job of teaching us biomechanics um, that's out there. And I highly recommend taking some of the introductory courses to open our eyes, but also give you a different lens at which you can look and understand movement. But we what we really want to do is create this dome shape back to our... Um, back to our diaphragm and when we're di when our diaphragm gets put back in a little more of a dome shape it's going to be at a better length tension relationship so it can be used more effectively as a respiratory muscle um, and it's going to allow us better airflow and it's going to change the length tension relationships up and downstream so up and downstream upstream is going to be um, every, anything that's attached to your rib cage and scapula and then down below is anything that's going to be attached to your femurs and to your pelvis Now the next thing we're going to talk about is these neural lymphatic points, right? Um, these neural lymphatic reflexes or neural lymphatics is referred to in applied kinesiology as locations in the body that are believed to affect a specific muscle or organ. They're used in applied kinesiology for diagnosing the relationship between weak, weak muscles and dysfunction with that muscle or its corresponding organ or gland or tissue. Neurolymphatic reflexes were discovered by Dr. Frank Ch Chapman, which was an osteopath in the 30s. Through palpation, Chapman found tender areas in the body which he believed to be the result of an increase um, or even congestion in lymph. And subsequent massage to that area would increase lymphatic drainage and lead to positive effects of the individual's health, corresponding especially corresponding to bodily organs, muscles, or glands. We'll talk about the lymphatic system a little bit later, but the key thing to understand is that we need movement to make sure our lymphatic system is going to be working correctly. Our lymphatic system is very um, passive in nature, unless, uh, unlike our circulatory system, which is very active as our heart works to pump blood throughout our body. <clears throat> our lymph system requires movement and requires some compression there so it's important to understand that sometimes we need to apply some of these massage techniques the next thing to start to understand um, is these neurofascial um, line neurofascial and fascial lines um, and another book that I highly recommend is is anatomy trains and what we're really trying to get at is ultimately our whole body is connected and fascia is a sensory organ that's that binds and surrounds everything We'll get into fashion in a little bit here, but we're going to start talking about RPR first. And this is kind of like how um, I learned about things, and this is ultimately like the journey that I'm sharing with you, how I under how I started to understand the material and information. 
So I first learned of RPR as Be Activated, um, and it's a system created by Douglas Heal, who's a um, physical therapist in South Africa. And um, Cal Dietz, JL Holdsworth, and Chris Corfist um, partnered with him, and they've kind of um, created the system RPR, which is really a strength coach's system of applying Be Activated. And so activation is a system where neural lymphatic reflex trigger points and abdominal breathing are used to stimulate muscles, which will lead to increased strength, resiliency, and through speed. Through activation, simple changes to incorrectly functioning muscles allow the body to make immediate shifts towards resilience, strength, and speed. Um, the activation results are incredible. An activated body will quickly change from a state of tension and pain to a strong, relaxed state of excellent performance. Uh, and when we do the right thing, the body responds immediately. So simulating these trigger points while diaphrag diaphragmatically breathing is the key to ultimately getting these, this system to work much more efficiently. And they'll often say is we want to shift the body from a sympathetic stressed um, alert stage more to a parasympathetic um, relaxed state where we can optimally move better and we can function um, without compensation. So RPR specifically is a system of daily self-care techniques that allow you to instantly feel and move better and live ultimately a better life. It's simply about controlling the electricity system of your body. In, um, and the system influences the nervous system, whereas other methods may address the mechanical muscular system. And I really believe, and they really believe too, it can enhance your other methods. It's almost like you want to be able to use this system first because I think it puts you in a way better state and way better position for other modalities and methods to be used to enhance your, your biomechanical system. So the body can be in two states. It's either exploding or imploding. And ultimately, we want to be able to fire in this one, two, three type pattern. An exploding, an exploding athlete is one that can fire in the right sequences and the right orders, whereas an imploding is in a stressed or compensated state where we're creating stability from outward to inward. When we're in an exploding state, we're creating stability proximally to distally. And the problem is, is when we start creating stability distally to proximally, it can, it can result in some firing pattern issues, which if we stay in that state for a long period of time, can create some, some big time injuries. Um, and it all comes down to breathing and moving. Like I said before, your body will find a way to breathe and move and it'll often compensate to do so. So second, you're going to use secondary muscles to breathe. You can use other muscles like your quad acting as your hip flexor hamstrings acting as your glutes and then we talk about these one two threes are specific muscles that work with every single zone so number zone one is specifically our psoas diaphragm and our glutes zone two is our quadriceps hamstrings lateral sling and abs and then zone three is our jaw our neck our arms lower leg and ultimately our shoulders so we did this for a while and i learned a lot and i helped my athletes a lot but um I wanted to understand more. I wanted to take a deeper dive. So I'd ask other professional professionals who have the courses and who have written about it. And one thing that kept coming up is that be, RPR and be activated is actually a combination of neural lymphatic points, neurovascular points, acupuncture points, and fascial points. It's all organized into this one system that is so reproducible that it's 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 insane. It's it's a it's a very good system at it, but. I wanted to start to understand fascia a bit more in its role in ultimately performance. So we'll talk about what fascia is. Fascia is, is mostly water and collagen under hydraulic pressure. Fascia is a colloid, which is really a mix of collagen fibers suspended in liquid gels. That makes it both a fiber and a fluid and gives fascia its viscoelastic properties. This means that fascia has a diverse range of structural features based on its length, its shape and density of the collagen fibers and the viscosity of the gels they mix with. Now you've got multiple layers of fascia um, within our body. So you've got your upper layer of, the, of your skin and underneath your skin you have a superficial layer of fascia. Um, underneath that you've got a layer of adipose tissue. Or sorry, underneath your skin you've got a layer of adipose tissue then a layer of your superficial fascia, then you have another layer of, of adipose tissue, and then your deep fascial layer. And then your deep fascial layer is connected to your muscle, and that's where a lot of your myofascial force transmission happens. Now this is a really cool video, um, 
but it kind of gives you a demonstration of how fascia works and this is our deep fascia layer but it's got key features so number one is its viscosity its ability of the tissue to slide against one each other against each other and that's probably the most important thing that you've got to start to understand here is that this deep fascia layer and muscle is intertwined and interconnected and when one layer moves the other layer is going to move and we want to make sure that that layer moves in as smooth as possible because that's going to affect ultimately affect how we move but it's also going to affect the information that's going to get sent back to the central nervous system second bit key feature is its elasticity its ability of the tissue to store and relax and release kinetic energy and the third thing is its plasticity it, which means its ability of tissue to, to resist distortion and to reshape itself along lines of stress. So through those are the three key features of fascia which are all really important to be able to understand. Um, and again, this video is from, this little excerpt is taken from a video called Strolling Under the Skin. It's a video you can find on YouTube. I highly recommend, it's about 30 minutes long. I um, highly recommend that you watch that. But another way to start to understand fascia, it's almost like peeling back a grapefruit. Like when you take the meat out of a grapefruit, like you have this webbing and you have this, um, you've got this webbing in between every single piece of that grapefruit. And when we take out some of that meat, you can start to understand how it's all connected. All that webbing is, is, is ultimately what fascia is in your body. It surrounds every single microtubule, it surrounds every muscle fiber, it surrounds groups of muscle fibers together, um, it, it's it's everywhere within your body. It surrounds your organs, it, it's, it's everywhere. And the key thing to understand about this fibrous fascial webbing is that it's full of nerve endings, which means that it's a body-wide sensory organ that facilitates our proprioception, which basically means it's teaching us or telling our body where we are within within our environment and within space. So why is it important? Research demonstrates that more than 30 to 40 percent of the force generated from the muscles transmitted not along a tendon but rather by the connective tissue within the muscle and fascia contains mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors. In other words, every time we use a muscle, we stretch fascia that's connected to spindle cells, Ruffini and Pacini corpus callus, and, and Golgi organs. The normal stretching of fascia thus communicates the force of the muscle contraction and the status of the muscle regarding its tone, movement, and rate of change in muscle length and position of the associated body part back to the central nervous system. And all that's really saying is that's ultimately proprioception. The brain, the CNS, like we talked about before, relies on the input from these receptors um, with it located within your muscles, tendons, joints, and skin to give it the information it needs to direct smooth and coordinated muscle movements. So what if the fascia where the receptors are, are located are restricted, damaged, densified, or not properly hydrated? Is it possible that the receptors which must be free to function are inhibited? Could inhibition of receptor function provide altered feedback Cody to the Monsieur central fascia, nervous system? Okay? And I'm going to torture him and give him all sorts of fascia restrictions. Uh, now, before I do, Cody's fascia suit is healthy. And notice the cobwebs, right? They're doing well, right? So he can lift his arms, he can move, he can go hike. Um, he can go play tennis. He can do it. He can tie his shoes. No pain. Okay. No problem. I'm about to change that. So I'm going to give Cody a myofascial restriction at his right rib cage and armpit. And if you could already see, he's already having to adapt a little bit against this. Good. So now Cody, go ahead and try to lift both arms up for me. And we're going to just woo. Good. Okay. So can you see that his range of motion is restricted? Restricted right now. Really try to lift them up higher, Cody. Okay, now drop them back down because, ow, that's not fun. Now, this makes sense, right? You can imagine how this is going to create this restriction. Did you notice what happened at his left shoulder over here? Uh huh, yeah? So go ahead, lift both of them again. A fascial restriction here is causing some serious range of motion issues over here. Now, let's drop that down, and I'm going to give him a fascial release and fix him up, and now, woohoo, yeah. Did you notice him kind of move his neck? That can. So well, that video gives you a good understanding of how a fascial restriction in one area can affect other areas of your body and not just the site. And start to understand the proprioceptive impact that that's going to have on the rest of your body too, 
right? Because we start to understand that everything is connected. So the big thing to really understand here is that fascia needs to be stretched. Um, and an inability of that fascia to stretch optimally affects the spindle cells. And remember, like we said before, altered fascia is going to dampen the signals back to the central nervous system because every time we get we stretch, that's, that those spindle cells are sending information back to our central nervous system. It's going to have altered proprioception. So fascia needs to be able to stretch for normal spindle cell feedback to the CNS and for optimal movement. And ultimately, what we can really get out of this too is that if the spindle cells are embedded in thick and densified fascia, its ability to stretch would be affected and the normal spindle cell feedback to the CNS is going to be impacted too, which ultimately impacts our movement. And when we train athletes, that's that's the name of the game is we got to enhance their ability to move. So if nothing's done to change the densification or restriction, then the restriction movement will not only affect the information sent to the CNS, but also can lead to decreased circulation since both blood and lymph require movement to flow properly through the tissues and carry off waste. The body's response to this impaired circulation is inflammation, which is actually an attempt to get more circulation into the area to clear out waste. Think of your body as a beautiful, clean river with a strong current washing the waste away. When the current is weak or there is no current at all, the waste remains in a stagnant, congested pool and you get a swamp instead of a river. Inflammation is the swamp, the result of a result of a buildup of waste. Over time, the response to inflammation could also be due to compensation due to impaired movements. The body produces excess collagen and lays more fascia down, which almost becomes like a glue. This can create further restriction, affect movement patterns, and increase imbalances even further. The longer the inflammation is present, the worse it can become. It can become a chain reaction. So healthy fascia has a gel-like texture. It's moist and slippery and holds water like a sponge. The higher the water content, the more gelatinous it will be. Fascia is extremely flexible and can take an incredible amount of pulling or compressing without being torn apart or crushed, which makes it a great structural component of the body. Soft, hydrated, flexible fascia enables the body to move freely. For example, lets a contracting muscle slide past the muscles next to it. Any form of compression or traction can make the tissue more gelatinous and increases the fascia's mobility, so you can change the fascia by doing work to it. Now, hyaluronic acid is a, the gliding component of your tissue that provides the viscosity or viscoelasticity of fascia. Turns out hyaluronic acid is a major component of the extracellular matrix that is created by a highly specialized type of fibroblasts. Hyaluronic acid is responsible for this viscosity and sliding action between muscles and fascia. Your body cycles through a tremendous amount of hyaluronic acid every single day. And when, and when hyaluronic acid is disorganized and not highly concentrated, it can turn into a sticky gel that binds our fascia tissue together, almost like a glue. Now, there's much evidence that activation of receptors is strongly dependent on the viscoelasticity of the surrounding tissue. Hopefully, you're starting to realize how this can ultimately impact our movement. We need fascia to stretch. We can activate spindle cells to provide information back to the CNS to allow optimal proprioception, and ultimately, that's going to impact our ability to move. And function at a really high level. So if you can get hyaluronic acid molecules to become more organized and increase their density, they become more like an oil, which means they're going to help fascia tissue glide more smoothly over the muscle. Heat is needed, needed to change the state of hyaluronic acid roughly between 99 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So that shows the importance of increasing tissue temperature in your warm-ups. Allow in Hyaluronic acid allows the muscles tissues to recover more quickly and also produce more power because we have better movement quality. And power comes from increased viscoelasticity. Without the ability to glide, muscle tissues and the soft tissues around them are going to become restricted in their ability to produce force. All, again, all comes back to movement efficiency, but what we really want to try to find out here is what's allowing our movement efficiency. Next big thing we're going to talk about is fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are the biomechanical architects of the fascial system. They produce fibers in the extracellular matrix, like little cellular spiders spinning out a web of collagen fibers and other chemicals along the directional lines of stress occurring within the matrix. And you can see that in this video that's playing too. They also secrete collagenase, which is an enzyme that eats collagen in areas where it's no longer needed or where it's old, so that's fraying. And it's so these fibroblasts are constantly removing and rebuilding fibers as they go. 
These little workers detect ongoing pressure and vibration signals coming into the extracellular matrix and respond in a localized supply and demand basis. It's your movement that organizes the slime. Fibroblasts can't do anything but leave it behind. It doesn't build bone. It doesn't build cartilage. Forces build those things. So what happens after this lattice work comes out of the fibroblasts is entirely dependent on the forces you put into the body. When you put load on the tissue, the cell cells migrate there and lay down traffic. This means that when you train fascia tissue consciously and correctly over time, you can develop robust strands of long collagen fibers that have a high tensile strength that have tremendous resiliency and elastic storage capabilities. The flip side is that injuries, surgeries, lack of activity, improper form, excessive rep, rep, repetitive motions can all weaken and damage fascia tissues, leading to chronic injuries, postural imbalances, tissue binding, weak joints, and um, other complications. Ultimately, the body responds to the demands that we place upon it. The mechanical transduction refers to the processes through which these cells spent, sense and respond to mechanical stimuli by, con by converting them to biochemical signals to elicit specific cellular responses. Basically, when fascia tissue is exposed to impact, vibration, pressure, or any kind of stress, an electrical charge is generated in the fascial tissue matrix that causes fibroblast cells to go to that spot and to start producing collagen. Mechanical action transduces information in the system. Whether it's rubbing, pressing, or moving, the system is going to react to that information. So if I've got a knot in my leg and I rub on it, that's a mechanical action. And all the structures, the fascia, the muscle, the lymph system, vessel system, and everything else are going to, re going to react accordingly to that mechanical stress. So the speed of the mechanical input, the force of the mechanical input, the vectors and angles, all that input are all going to result in unique reactions. If you don't put demand on the body to make connections among these various tissues, they won't develop. So hopefully you're starting to gain an understanding of how deep and intricated fascia is, um, but also how it's impactful to understanding how RPR works. Um, so now we're going to start to shift gears and get away from the heavy science stuff and talk a little bit more about how we train our fascia. So fascia is plastic, and we learned that earlier as well as it being elastic. It can be reshaped by the right kind of stretching. Plasticity is not the same as elasticity. When you stretch a plastic substance and hold it briefly, it remains stretched out. But when you let it go, whereas an elastic substance snaps back. It's the difference between taffy and a rubber band. If you pull taffy and hold it for a minute, it stays stretched out instead of snapping back like a rubber band. The collagen and fascia gives its taffy-like quality. Repeated stretching and holding can actually um. help to remodel it. Massage people might use, certainly the kind that I teach, depends on a third property of the fascia, which is called um, sorry, plasticity. Uh, you've heard of neuroplasticity, but this is fascial plasticity. So if you watch, as I stretch the fascia, which I'm doing in the microscope here, beyond its elastic capacity, it still can go back to where it was, but when I let go, it's not going to go back to where it is. It has taken on a new length. It is this kind of ability to not only stretch but lengthen, to ease out, to restore the glide that is the basis of Hatha Yoga, which is the basis of the kind of work that I do. Um, and there are a number of practices who are going to reach into these kinds of properties of the fascia. And if you start to look... Uh, and that's a video by Thomas Myers. Uh, again, the author of Anatomy Trains. So there's ways that we can prepare our fashion. We often do this pre-workout or pre-training, uh, maybe post on a recovery day. De it depends on what we need to do. Um, but compression work to your soft tissue, whether it be massage, ART, fascia manipulation, self-myofascial work, grass, and can be stimulative and helpful to your fascia. It can be used to align collagen fibers, remove densifications, and also drive efferent feedback to your spindle cells and proprioceptors. Also helps affect our tone, and tone is going to regulate our mobility. More serious cases will need the expert techniques of a trained professional. Fascial stretching, spinal decompression techniques such as Aldoa, which we're going to talk about, can be used to stimulate sp spindle cells and also change the tone within the fascial system and is much more of a traction-based technique. So the two ways that we can affect our fascia are compression and traction. Compression is what I think we all do a lot of um, by um, soft tissue work and, and rolling out and using lacrosse balls and different implements. But traction and doing it effectively is, is, a, is very different than regular muscle stretching, but it has a different impact than our compression does too. 
So we know about muscle stretching. However, it's difficult to stretch a muscle if it's wrapped in a leathery sleeve which does not give. It's better to consider each muscle as links and change extending throughout the length of the entire body. The goal of every myofascial stretch is to tension the fascia that encases the muscle in order to normalize the length and function of the fascial change. We're going to use a towel analogy. Um, and we want to tension both sides of the towel. Right? Suppose I stretch a beach towel out so it's perfectly smooth. If I grab it at the center and pull upward, the to towel is going to fold towards my hand and it's going to create a big fold. When I let it go, the fold remains. This towel is now like a fascia with the densification. If I try to smooth it out by pulling at the towel, it's going to take forever because the towel is going to slide around creating new folds. A better method is to hold down one end of the towel and pull the other end. In exactly the same way when you're trying to smooth out a muscle, you can exert more leverage on it by holding down both ends of its chain so the whole chain is taut. Otherwise, everything slips around just like the towel does. Tensioning both ends of a fascial line can better stretch the middle or tightest part of that chain. And stretching, uh, uh, fascial stretching works so effectively due to Sherrington's law, which is really reciprocal inhibition. It, and it's not easy. It's very challenging. And as you can see in this video, this is an L5S1 position that we're doing with some of our athletes here. They're dorsiflexed. They're internally rotated. They're trying to press their sacrum into the floor. At the same time, they're trying to extend, or sorry, flex their shoulders, extend their wrists out to the side, and they're tensioning everything from fingertips to their toes. So key points, right? I found that long stretches is what's actually going to help create change. You can be do it for time or you can do it for breaths. And what we want to do is really focus on feeling tension and lengthening um, happening. This helps to solidify our mind-body connection too. And when we do them and we organize them in training, we want to focus proximal to get optimal firing the spindle cells around the core and the hips to drive stability there. And then we work outward. So the order in which you do the stretches is really going to move, matter. Um, and then like, the key thing I like to say with our athletes too is what does not move well gets stuck. So we want to move it so we don't lose it, right? So focus proximal, so focus on the spine, the hips, and then we kind of work up or down from that standpoint. Here's some examples of some fascial stretching, right? So this is a classic hip flexor stretch, but a little bit different. Um, the angle of our femur is going to be slightly different. The, the reach with the arms, the extension of our wrists. Um, we've got a 90-90 stretch here, but with the incorporation of the arms and, and um, wrists extended completely changes how that stretch is going to feel and the impact it can have on your body. And then this is a frontline stretch where we're literally stretching everything from um, uh, the tops of our feet all the way to our interior tib, quads, hip flexors, obliques, pecs, biceps, all the way down to our uh, wrist flexors as well. So it's a really great way to connect our whole body and connect and open up those fascial lines. So how do we implement it? So RPR, we usually do prior to training sessions. We uh, It kind of fills a block of our get prepared. Um, it's used to improve our sense and feel. And the way we coach is we're very big qualitative tacticians and we want to make sure that we can enhance our athletes' ability to sense and feel their bodies being connected so that we're driving proprioception where we want to be. Um, this helps us get our athletes to feel better and be in a better state to begin training. Um, we often do it as a team. It's coach-led. Sometimes it's player-led too, depending on the situation, but oftentimes it's coach-led. Uh, we rip through it fairly quickly. It takes about three minutes to get done. We do this pre-training, pre-practice, pre-game. Um, can we also another way that we implement RT, RPR is in between sets of exercises to enhance feel and groove patterns. So, for instance, we might um, we might rub our hamstring points before we do a deadlift. We might rub our um, glute points before we do a squat. We may improve. We do our calf resets, but in between sets of squats, um, just to make sure that we're driving um, force where we want to get it from. And then how we incorporate Aldoa and fascial stretching. Um, it's number one used to stimulate those prep receptors embedded within the fascia. Um, remember that we said before and we saw the video from Thomas Myers, retraction is used to stimulate. Um, spinal poses, pre-training. Um, and I showed you that video, the L5-S1. Um, usually sometimes we'll do it in between sets of exercise to increase neural drive for antagonists, like a quad stretch in between deadlifts. Post training, we use, can use them as to recovery and then specific regeneration methods. And then we've got a rec recovery um, question that we'd like to ask 
our student athletes when they want to act, when they want some specific recovery stuff is we'll often say, oh, okay, I want to recover blank and I want it to be. So the first one is you want it to be specific or local um, or everything or global and then active or passive. And so we've created like a little bit of a matrix here um, where everything global and we have all the way down to specific and local and then passive and active. Like do you want to be lazy or do you actually want to move? And RPR and LDOA kind of fits us into this specific local active category, right? So it's active, requires some um, effort and requires movement. It's not it's not very passive, um, but you can work on target areas and we've created different LDOA and different fascial stretches for every different part of our um for parts of our body we put different programs together whether it be mid thoracic programs shoulder hips ankles um, and we've just got them laminated up in our weight room and athletes will come in and they'll do them on their own um, so it's a uh, the the really nice thing about RPR and LDO and the impact it's had upon our program is we know that it works when the student athletes will do it when it's not even programmed so it's had a massive impact on our on our program, how our athletes feel, but ultimately how they move too. And our athletes can feel that and they can they can clarify that and they the power of it too is when they'll teach new and incoming athletes how to do the how to do the stretches the the correct way. Um, so please feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, contact information you can get from Coach DeMarco. Um, but I really thank you for your time and hopefully I was able to open your eyes to a different way of incorporating um, some new methodologies out there. Thank you.